Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to the part three orientation for semester two, 2017. My name is Karina Chung. I'm head of product and professional development. I look after continuing professional development and the exam writing process. Along with me, I have Eleanor Mazando sitting there, who's the education manager and team leader, who looks after education program as well as the operations. Supporting her, we have also Chantophone. Um, she looks after the education day-to-day -day processes. Guest speakers for today, we have Danny Bashara, who's the 2B Chief Examiner. We also have Bruce Thompson here, who's the Commercial Actual Practice Chief Examiner. They'll both take you through the uh, exam structure as well as uh, the examination techniques that they'll be kind enough to share with everyone here. Bonus speakers for today, we have five prize winners sitting along here in front of everyone. They'll go through their experiences for part three and provide insights in terms of how they went through studying part three and will also um, share some stories along their journey in terms of succeeding in completing a part three course. I'll first uh, start off the presentation by going through the associate pathway. So first we need to complete part one. That consists of, if you're doing it through the UK system, that consists of eight core technical examinations. However, you can do this through a university by doing an undergraduate degree. Part two consists of the actual control cycle as well as the investments in asset modeling. You also need to complete the three year practical experience requirement. So with this, as long as you've commenced your actual studies, you can actually count um, your paid work experience towards your practical experience requirement. Lastly, you need to complete the professionalism course. It's a really fun um, course where it's a two-day non-assess, usually held at a hotel venue. It's a presentation-based course, and it is an opportunity where you can actually network with either fellows or associates, because fellows and associates associates actually attend the same professionalism course. Looking at the fellow pathway, you can see that everything is the same with the exception of part three. Is anyone here that's sitting that's doing part three for the first time? Oh, okay, great. <laughs> that's good. Anyone here who's actually repeating part three? Not a problem. Good luck. So sorry to bore those who actually have um, done part three course before, but just to really give a more sort of um, understanding for our part three program um, that's delivered by the Institute, I'll go through the four modules that that's part of the part three program. So module one, you can either choose one of the following options. So for the first option here, you can see it's the enterprise risk management course that consists of the UK examination ST9 exam as well as a one-day non-assessed workshop that's held at the Institute here in the forum. Another similar method is the private health insurance course. Again, you need to complete the ST1 exam and also enroll into an online private health insurance course. You, you get nine months enrollment and at the end of the enrollment, you actually need to submit an assessment. If you have a PhD, in any of the relevant actuarial field, there's a committee that actually reviews your application and you may be deemed an exemption for module one. If you have a full accountancy qualification, whether that be CPA, ICA or CFA, you can actually receive an exemption for module one or part three only. In terms of the last option, I'll go through that shortly. Moving on to module two, it is, this is the exciting part where you actually decide in terms of where you're actually wanting to specialize in. So whether you want to be in life insurance actuary, general insurance, investment, or superannuation. So I'm just going to use the life insurance actuary as an example. If I want to be a life insurance um, actuary, I'll need to first complete 2A, and going in more depth, I'll need to complete 2B. So module two is more of an introduction to the actual specialist area. Um, module three actually builds on on that. So if you want to specialize in life insurance, you'll need to complete 2A and 2B, and that applies the same for the other specialist areas. Now, just going really quickly back to the module one, the last option, in terms of any 
are the part one, sorry, part A or part B. So if I'm a life, uh, life insurance actuary, I will have to complete 2A and 2B. Therefore, you can use any other remaining subjects from module two or three to complete module one. Now, module four is really easy. So thankfully, we have Bruce here who will go into more detail, but I'll just quickly give you like a more general sort of um, information for commercial actual practice. So it's a four-day residential course held off-site. Um, if you do not reside in Sydney, there is the option of actually attending it, um, actually, sorry, actually staying at a nearby hotel. Um, for CAP, there are five topics, five exam topics and four ass uh, assignment topics. At the end of the course, you'll be issued the assignment topic that you'll need to complete. It is also a pre presentation based um, course where you receive feedback as well. Do we have any questions before I move away from the part three program? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so the understanding is that module two is the introduction to the course. So it is, I mean, it is sort of recommended that you do do module two. However, we do have funny courses, for example, some of you may know investment is only offered in semester two, and we have the um, BRIS, which is the Global Retirement Income Systems, that's only offered from 6A, semester one. So um, although we tell students to actually enroll into module two first, before enrolling into module three, but that doesn't stop anyone from enrolling into module three first. Well, that's an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting approach, but that's fine. I mean, it, it's completely up to the individual. I mean, what I do recommend is that you look at the um, course outline as well as the learning objectives, because sometimes the units may be more relevant to what you're currently practicing as an actor, well, not an actuary, but as an analyst or in your role. So you may find that it will be easier for you to complete module three first. However, it's just like a standard recommendation that we do is to recommend students to actually complete module two and then module three, just because module three is usually a build up from module two. At the moment, um, yes, it is possible. We do have an application form on our website. I think the application is called uh, change of course. You can complete that and then submit that to the education team and we'll just process that for you. Okay, okay. that's okay. Any other further questions? I sure. just make one comment. Um, I do investment, so it's caveat supplied. Um, but I found this is a good, but I did 5B first, and I found this is probably a good 5B before yep. 5A, but 5A was definitely the easier of 5B. Yeah. Um, so that's just. Just to jump in there, yep. life insurance, I would not recommend doing it before this course. Okay, well, that's a good recommendation then. <laughs> That's okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. So how is part three different from a university? So I'm not too sure how many of you are actually completed parts one and two and actually coming from a university to a part three. But I just want to stress that um, Self-learning and strong commitment is highly recommended when you're doing part three. It is not like a university where you get to see familiar faces, attend weekly tutorials, lectures, um, and you know be sort of like motivated by your tutors and your lecturers. Although we do have tutors and tutors and forum moderators, moderators online to help you sort of support with your studies, but it is a lot different to um, in a university sort of environment. Work-life balance is very important because you are the best person to judge what your personal commitments are and how you sort of allocate your study schedules. Therefore, you will feel a little bit of more of an individual sort of pressure because you are the boss of, I should say, um, your own timetable. Again, with this, you do have less interactions with other candidates because you don't see them on a weekly basis. So, um, but you know, counter that, we do have our online forum moderator, uh, sorry, 
online um, discussion forums where you can actually do uh, daily posts um, and connect with other students through that mean. On the positive note, we do have our exams um, as open book exams. Um, it does assess complex judgment as well as application of theories. Our examination is three hours long with 15 minutes planning time. I'm sure like Bruce and Danny will go in more further depth with that. What you can do to sort of help yourself. So I do strongly recommend that you actually form study groups, whether that be people that you are currently working with or whether that be people that you've met through tutorials that we host here at the forum or through the online discussion forums that we have through the online learning management system. Discuss requirements with your work. I strongly advise that you do talk to your employers in terms of what sort of um, study leave that you may be eligible to or that your employer might be open-minded to flexible working arrangement to suit your study schedules. In terms of work, uh, web support mechanisms, so again, I've discussed that we have the online learning, uh, sorry, the online discussion forums. With that, we have a forum moderator who actually monitors your posts and discussions. And, you know, if that's not enough, you are more than welcome to contact the education team. Prioritising is very important. Like I said before, you are the best judge to actually prioritise what's important to you, your study schedules, and uh, what works best for you. Stick to a routine. That's highly recommended because once you actually get into routine, you get your mind trained. So whether that be dedicating two to three hours in the morning or two to three hours in the evening. Or both. Or both, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who are the part three students? Um, I'm sure our five prize winners here will go into more detail and you can actually see them here as well. But just on a more sort of um, general um, statement, every semester we receive over 400 enrolments. Of those 400 enrolments, there are over 80% who are based in Australia. Majority of our students are actually working or um, enrolled into general insurance and life insurance. Most of them have completed parts one and two Although it's not a prerequisite, but it is sort of another recommendation that we do um, tell our students to actually have completed part one just because it focuses on developing your technical skills and part two because of it sort of helps you develop your application of knowledge skills. 70% of our students actually dedicate 11 to 20 plus hours per week to study for part three. Although it says like 11 to 20 plus hours, I highly recommend at least 20 plus hours per week. <laughs> the average time to complete part three is approximately three years, and that's if you complete part three in your first go. So if you get a pass in your first go as well. On average, we get 60 to 80 new qualified fellows each year. I know that number is not low, but it really shows you how much of a lengthy process that is and how much of a commitment that they dedicate to their studies. And actually qualifying as a fellow is something that's really rewarding. Do we have any questions before I hand you guys over to Eleanor? Or are you guys here just for the pizza? <laughs> yes, you guys will have pizza at the end of this. Okay, Eleanor. Um, sorry, I'm just going to do something quickly. Okay. All right, so um, as, Karina, as Karina has already let you know, I'm the education manager and team leader. So we oversee basically all the logistics and the operations around running the part three program. And so uh, what I'm going to cover in this section is just basically all the logistical information, what support is available for you from the Institute, as well as just a minor touch on what's involved in the assessment in the different subjects. Um, of course, it will be more interesting to hear from our panel here who've all gone through it and they can give you, you know, a more in-depth insight. Um, Bruce and Danny will be giving us the chief examiner's perspective and the students will be giving us a little bit of perspective from 
Here it's there, all good. <laughs> um, and they'll just be sharing with you, you know, um, some of their experience. So I'll just take you through the logistical side of things. Um, so as a Part B student, you get access to the learning management system, which is the main tool that we'll utilize for Part 3. So that's where you'll find um, your different materials that you require, your course notes. There's a news forum in there. There is also, um, for the first time in this semester, there is a student forum. So there's... Um, if you go to the top of the LMS, there is the main news forum, which is where we'll do all our communication with you guys, any important notes, any reminders about forum participation, reminders about when tutorials are scheduled, they will come through that and you'll all automatically um, subscribe to that forum. So you will get the emails that come from there. But we've also created a student forum, which is, um, as Karina said, about you guys being able to interact with each other. So if you want to maybe set up a study group and, you know, you want to talk to the other students, that's another place you can do it. You do have to subscribe individually to that if you want to be part of all of that. And so there is also a document in the LMS that lets you know how to subscribe, unsubscribe from forums. So you're automatically subscribed to the main news forum as well as the online participation forum. And then anything else you want to participate in, in the LMS, you would have to subscribe yourself to. We also have the course calendar, which just shows you the upcoming events. So um, you would have seen maybe a reminder about the tutorial today. I'm um, sorry, the orientation today, and you'll see the tutorial dates up there. And if there are any other important dates, for example, if people are in CAP, you'll see information about when the PTAs will be due, when you'll be receiving marks, residential course, and that sort of thing. And that will be in the calendar. Uh, you have the participation discussion forum, of course, which is um, part of the assessment, and I'll go a little bit deeper into that, and that you can access as well in the LMS. Uh, course notes and readings are available there, as well as just a link to the past exams, um, any tutorial recordings. So once a tutorial is conducted, we'll, we put up a recording of it. So if you're not able to attend via WebEx, um, as we've done here, or in person, there will be a recording up the next day for you to be able to see what went on in the tutorial, as well as the slides and any information that a teacher may want to put up for you to access prior to the tutorial or after will be in that section. And we also make the recordings available in audio if you want to listen maybe while you're traveling as well. Um, so for module two and three, which um, Karina has kind of taken us through, which is um, the course 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, 5A, 5B, and 6A, 6A, 6B, we do have um, three tutorials per semester. The first lot of tutorials will be starting in two weeks. So there's two dates up on our website. There are dates up as well in the LMS. And on our, on our website, you'll be able to access the past exams. We've got the past assignment papers up for you there. And the BOE reports, the one for semester one will be going up next week. So that traditionally goes up a month after results are released. So um, you can look out for that on Monday. And um, this is an important tool to utilize, which I'm sure um, the guys will go through as well. It's good to look over the past papers and the BOE reports because they will give you information in terms of what the examiners were looking for, areas where there was weakness in the exams and the attempts. And um, with the past exams as well, we will have the marking guides up there. So if you want to attempt a question and then mark it yourself and that sort of thing, that's always helpful. So this is just a picture of what the LMS looks like. Um, I think you should all have access, but if anyone doesn't, please feel free to contact the education team and we will get you access to your course. So a couple of the policies and procedures that we have in place to support you guys, obviously academic honesty is important. It's about the profession, it's about you guys also, you know, just doing your best and presenting your best foot. So we have the code of conduct, which is available on our website. And, you know, we encourage you all to read that um, with all exams and assignments. Obviously, there are a couple of procedures to make sure there's no plagiarism, you know, and that sort of thing. So we ask you guys just to come into this in the same way that you would go into your profession, because this is the start of it. You're preparing to be out there and represent the profession. Um, so we have a couple of things to support you with enrollments, as well as, you know, your journey throughout the course. So we do have a free free release policy available, which is, um, which gives sort of a 50% um, off on, full, on the full fees. Um, there are some qualifying criteria for that. Um, so it's, it's for certain, um, obviously, um, low income countries. And if you're paying for it yourself, there's going to be no reimbursement. And 
there was a third slide here, which off the top of my head I can't remember, but that is available for you on our website. So please have a look and, you know, if possibly maybe you weren't aware of it prior to enrollment and you do feel that you qualify, if you could contact the education team and we'll kind of walk you through that process as to how we can put that in place for you. Um, withdrawals, changes um, from the subject. So we're currently still in enrollment period. Um, so there, you can withdraw from a subject and, you know, things do come up as well during the semester. We have a form that's available on our, on our website. As we go more and more closer to exam dates, um, the refund amount reduces, obviously, just because, you know, you have been taking advantage of the course. Um, so if you want to have a look at that, if you feel, you know, maybe looking at your schedule, you might not be able to make it for exams and that sort of thing. Um, that policy is always available, so please do um, fill in the forms and, you know, if, if it is for special circumstances, we always consider that. We've had people, you know, like have had a baby day before and, you know, that's nothing that you can control. So, you know, we always consider the circumstances that you guys are under, so please feel free to have a look on the website and contact us as the education team if you have any questions about anything regarding the course. Um, shortly, we'll be contacting a couple of you about your exam centre, so when you do enroll there's a couple of um, standard exam centers which we hold all our exams at Clifton here in Australia and around the world but um, if we don't have enough people sit in an exam center so if we have two or less people registered in an exam center we will ask you to set up a temporary exam center which involves finding a fellow to supervise you in a sort of an individualized um, atmosphere um, so a couple of you have already nominated that and we'll be in touch with you shortly and we do assist you as well to find the fellow so we try as much as possible to be able to support you to sit at the standard exam centers, but um, if we don't have enough people sitting at a center, sometimes we, you know, do have to move you to a temporary exam center, but we will support you with that process to ensure that you have the right environment for your exam and that you have people supervising you and everything is in place for you to be able to sit your exam. Uh, we can also arrange access arrangements, so if there's, you know, if you need special access to a center, you're on crutches, or, you know, you need special access, that can be done through the website as well, there's a form there. Um, now, the policies I'm going to go through now were kind of like after exams, but a few of them can be assessed before exams. So we have a special consideration policy, which is available if, for example, if you're in CAP and you don't think you'll be able to hand in your assignment on time, we ask you to send us a special consideration application. And that um, basically lets, it's a policy that allows you to make changes to the exam. Well, the exam conditions in terms of if you're, maybe you've got a hurt back or you need to bring in a special chair or anything. So anything that is around a change to the standard exam environment, you would need to put in a special consideration application. Um, if there's a delay in handing in an assignment, you would need to put that in. And then it can also be utilized for after the exam. For example, if there's something you wanna make the examiners aware of in how you conducted your exam. So if, you know, God forbid, if your computer just blacks out for 10 minutes or something like that, and we need to make the examiners aware, we would always ask for you to put in a special consideration application. So it's worth taking a look at and just seeing what's involved with that, because you always have to put in supporting, a supporting document, a doctor's note or anything, if, you know, if, there's, if it's a medical condition. And so just to be aware of what's involved with that. And then um, a support that we do offer is an exam performance interview, but this is, you know, after your exam. So there's a few qualifying factors for that as well. And this is an opportunity to basically sit with either a chief examiner or an assistant examiner and go through your exam attempt. That's if you haven't, that's obviously if you haven't been successful in your attempt and you've set the exam twice and you have to have an average of a C on the latest attempt. And um, what it is is the chief examiner here, I'm sure they'll go through it a little bit, um, sit with you and they kind of go through your attempt and point you out the areas that you need to improve, what lets you down and that sort of thing. Um, so the candidate number will be a number that you've assigned you know, probably about six weeks into the semester. And this is the number that you use on your exams. It's also the number that you use as an identifier on your CAP assignment. And that's just to de-identify you for the markers and that sort of thing. So that's the number we ask you to use in your main communications for exams and assignments as your identifier, not to include your name or anything else. That would be easy for us to know that, you know, that was that person over there. <laughs> as you're aware, we do have volunteers that help on the education program. So, you know, we have, you know, the lovely people here. 
and we have chief examiners, markers, everybody who's involved are obviously within the profession. So we try to obviously make it as impartial as possible, which is why we give you the identifier. And that's what we use when we exam the clinicians in the assignment as well. All right, so do we have any questions so far? So I'll quickly run through my part because I'm sure all the excitement is over here. Um, so I'll quickly go through. Yeah. <laughs> I'll quickly go through the assessment um, for the different part three modules. So for course seven A ERM, those of you who are doing uh, module one, you have the UK exam, which is the ST nine exam. So that's a hundred percent of the of of, of um, the assessable part, and then you also need to attend the ERM workshop. So the ERM workshop is for the Australian perspective, and that is compulsory to attend. So you have to sit in attendance. There's no assessment with that. It's a one-day workshop. Um, you may have seen two dates available on the website. That's just to give you the option to attend at either day. Then for health, it's a similar sort of um, setup. So you have the exam, which is 100%, obviously. It's a UK exam that we utilize as well, the specialist technical exams. And then you have to complete the online um, private health insurance course, which is always available for enrollment, um, but open all the time. For module two and three, which is 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, 5A, 5B, 6A. <laughs> I got lost in my order there. Um, we have the online participation mark, which is 10% of the mark, and then the exam, which is three questions, as everybody may already get, it's a three hour exam. That makes up 90% of the assessment mark. Um, that differs slightly with module four, which is CAP. So with CAP, the exam is 80% of the mark, and then you have the post course assignment that makes up 20%. The CAP exam is the only one that doesn't go for three hours. The CAP exam goes the whole day, so that's an eight hour exam. And um, yeah, just to give you a little more information around that. All right, so the exam, like I said, it makes up 90% of the assessment mark. Um, it's a three hour exam, 15 minutes planning time and reading. It's open book, so you can bring uh, materials with you, your notes and that sort of thing. We do provide um, the course notes as well as the textbooks in PDF format, so you don't have to really carry those things and try to minimize how much stuff you have around you on the desk. Um, yeah, but you're basically welcome to bring um, any sort of material, reference material that you would need to the exam with you. Um, it's, yeah, it's an online exam, so it's conducted via the computer using any Word, any Excel. Um, it's, I think it's Microsoft um, 2010. And yeah, the standard digital materials will be provided, and obviously you can access past exams if you attend to the LSS. The online discussion forum makes up 10% of the mark, and um, this is available for you in the LMS. So that's what the section looks like in the LMS there, and this would just have a bit of a guideline for you and how to view um, posts from other students. So this is a little bit on the discussion forum. Now, 10% may sound like a little bit, but um, as I'm sure our people here will let you know, it is quite important. And so we encourage you guys to get started on that as early as possible, not to wait till the last minute and try to all rush it at the end. Um, because that just gives you the opportunity to be able as well to respond to other people's posts. Um, so for the discussion forum, you have to make six, six posts. The two must be original, so a discussion that you actually initiate yourself. And then four posts will be responding to others. So see other people's posts and give a little bit of feedback there. And um, I'll just go into the next one, which is how the marking is done. So this is how um, the marking is assessed for the forum participation. As you can see, you know, there's a little bit around the communication. You know, there's the minimum requirement. So have you met the requirements of the person? And then how well it's communicated as well. And um, yeah, that's available for you as well in the LMS. And obviously the slides will be available if you want to refer back to what you are the semester. So for semester one, which you'll see when the Board of um, Examiners report is published next week, out of um, the students that we had, only 47% reached a 10 out of 10 for that um, participation mark. And it can usually be, you know, just a little difference between a pass and a fail sometimes if, you know, if you're on that borderline. So it is quite important. 
Um, so that's just a quick summary of the participation marks. So oh, we had a really good result in 5B last semester. Everybody actually got 10 out of 10. It was really, really good. And that's like one of the first times we've had all the students within one subject get to that level. So that was really exciting. Um, 6A had the lowest participation mark. It's, you know, the lowest average of 7.4, followed by um, 3B. And lastly, before we get into all the excitement, so this is the pass rates over the years. Um, for this, for 2017, we are at 34%, which is slightly lower than last semester where we had 36. The previous um, semester one of 2015, we were at 32. So you can see that it does fluctuate. We've tried to kind of map this out and work out what it is, but there doesn't seem to be a pattern. It seems like it's all in your hands and it's up to you guys. And so, you know, we just encourage you guys to just jump in and those are the things that are available to support you. And if you do have any questions about anything, maybe that you didn't see there and you have some questions around, feel free to contact the experts and see. So I'm going to hand over to Danny shortly. So do you have any questions before Danny comes up? No questions? All right, great. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, so my name is Danny Bashar. I'm the uh, Chief Examiner of 2B Life Insurance. So I'm going to keep it brief because I know we've got a lot of good speakers here and there's a good Q&A session at the end. Uh, so just briefly repeating what um, Eleanor mentioned, the exam structure for Modules 2 and 3. So 2B is one of those, um, part of Module 3. So it's three hours exam. Um, 15 minutes is planning time, so we can plan your answers, but you can't actually complete your answers. Computer-based, as Eleanor mentioned, so uh, answers in Word can use Excel for calculations. Um, there's typically at least one case study type question which requires Excel um, and, and analysis around that and explanation and judgment around that. Um, it's open book, as Eleanor mentioned, um, with some materials provided electronically, such as the textbook. And um, I'll just note for your purposes when you're looking back, the exam structure did change in 2016. So between 2013 and 2015, there was a multiple choice um, uh, component as well as a long answer component. And that the multiple choice was removed in 2016 and it's just a, a long answer component. So there was a change there, just in case you're looking back. Exam techniques. So I'll just give you my main uh, pointers about exam techniques from my perspective as an examiner. So I'd recommend you read the question twice but answer it once. You're not going to get um, marks, you know, if you repeat yourself and you're not going to actually get marks if you don't answer what's actually asked. Um, don't waffle. So use succinct sentences to say what you want to say. So sometimes we see students who write a whole bunch of things which can be replaced by three or four words. Use the three or four words. It'll save you time and it'll be clearer to the markers. Structure your answer well, so um, bullet points are appropriate in many cases, so use those. Make it easier for the marker to give you marks. That's what you want to aim for. Hit the nail on the head, so what I mean by that is make your points precisely and accurately and start with the most important points rather than starting with obscure points because they'll get you the, you know, the most marks in some cases. Um, make things clear, so don't be ambiguous. So don't leave doubt in the mind of the marker or examiner as to whether you mean something or not. So make it clear what you do mean so there's no room for doubt. Uh, provide additional insight. Give the so what. So if you can do that, you are um, showing a high degree of complex judgment, which is a key part of the exams. Uh, think about who your audience is and their context. So this is important because not all questions will be... Um, aimed at uh, you answering to a qualified actuary. There will be cases where you're answering a question in a different context to a different person who knows different things. And so using jargon in that case may not be appropriate. So that's important. Uh, and aim to demonstrate knowledge and understanding and judgment across all the areas being assessed. So this typically requires a good attempt at each and every question. So typically there's three questions in the modules two and three. Um, try to avoid the situation where you do really well on one question and then don't do well on the other two because it's unlikely you will pass if, you don't, if you're not able to demonstrate you know knowledge and judgment across the key areas being assessed. A few pointers about what we look for in a successful answer. 
Um, so we, we ask ourselves, do we believe this candidate is fit to practice as a fellow? And we look for a few key things, like have they shown understanding of the key concepts and can apply the principles? Have they avoided statements which show um, serious misunderstandings or are dangerous to the profession? Have they presented reasonable arguments to back up their conclusions? And have they recognised when a number looks wrong or unreasonable? Because we, we re recognise that under time pressure you may make mistakes, but um, if something, if you've got a negative net assets, for example, that is quite unreasonable. So if you call that out, you know, I made a mistake, it looks a lot better than someone who's just said nothing because we don't know whether you thought that it was reasonable to get that answer or not. Demonstrate complex judgment. Some tips to prepare for the exams. Um, have a good understanding of the syllabus item. So this is important, uh, each and every one of them. Um, so if you actually read, so there was a question about 2A and 2B. So before the syllabus items for 2B, it actually mentions that 2A is presumed knowledge and can be brought into the course for 2B and the exam for 2B. So that's something to consider when uh, deciding whether to do 2B before 2A. Practice lots of past questions under exam conditions because that's how you're going to sit the actual exam. Uh, swap attempts with other students and mark each other's work or ask fellows to mark them for you. That, that would be a useful exercise to see where your weaknesses are. Um, ask actuaries who have passed exams in the, you know, in the past what their tips are and to clarify if you've got points of confusion with the content because I'm sure most of them will be willing to help. Um, keep up to date with industry issues, um, hot topics and developments because they're sometimes brought into the exams and uh, you know, a very good um, discussion point for your online forum which makes up 10% of your, of your marks. And yeah, over participate in the online forum because the, the more you participate and the more you're, you're um, getting breadth of knowledge about the different issues and how they apply, the better off you are in preparing for the exam. So don't leave it too late, start now. And uh, all the best of luck. <laughs> we'll leave the Q&A we'll questions until the Q&A, I think. Yeah. Oh, no, if you've got any specific questions, now's probably a good time to jump in, Danny. Any specific questions? Excellent. I'll pass on to Bruce. Okay, thank you. The good news or the bad news is Danny and I haven't discussed beforehand what each of us was going to talk about. And if you know the story of you ask a question of two actuaries, you get three answers. Um, here, you've got the opportunity to get a lot more than three answers. And some of us will say things that are different, hopefully not completely the opposite, but different. Your job is to figure what's going to work for you. I want to maybe talk a bit more about preparing for the exam. I want to start with motivation. We technical type people tend to underestimate emotional type things like motivation. And we tend not to be very good at doing it for ourselves. Unlike at university, you've got to do all this by yourself. What's going to motivate you to pass? You're going to get a pay rise? Yeah, probably. You're probably already pretty well paid compared to your peers anyway who are not actuarial people. So is a pay rise going to be enough to motivate you to pass? Maybe not. The only argument I can think of at the moment for buying property in overpriced Sydney is mortgage yourself to the hilt and you will need a pay rise. <laughs> What's going to motivate you to pass? Um, What's going to motivate you to pass is down the track somewhat. What's going to motivate you to study tonight and tomorrow night and the next night? Break it up into little bits and give yourself a reward when you've done the little bit, right? What am I doing tomorrow night? Oh, I'm going to study. Well, yeah, okay. What am I going to do tomorrow night? I'm going to read chapter four and make some notes and understand it. Right? More specific. If you've done management courses, you might have heard of SMARTA, S-M-A-R-T-A. -A. Right? And when you're managing staff, this is one of the ways of 
getting agreement as to what that staff member is about to do, and it might be in the next hour or it might be in the next six months, but you have to set objectives. And I suggest you manage yourself in this smarter way. S stands for specific. Sorry, what have I done? Smarter. <laughs> S is specific, and objectives have to be specific. M, measurable. A, achievable. Can't be impossible. R, relevant. T, timed, right? By when has this got to be done? And A, agreed. You have to ha make sure your staff member actually agrees with you. Yes, they're going to do this. Not, no, Bruce, up yours. I'm not going to do that. All right? Manage yourself smarter so that Every day you have something that you can achieve. And if you've achieved it, give yourself a reward. I don't know whether that's a lolly or a bit of time off or a trip to the whatever, right? Have a measurable objective and reward yourself for achieving it. And if punishment rather than reward is what drives you, maybe have a punishment for not achieving it. Um, most people, though, will be better off having a reward. When you're at university, if you could memorise all the course material, textbook, etc., um, you would be extremely likely to be able to pass the exam and probably get a distinction. Out here, bad luck. You're in the real world. And these courses, unfortunately, are not quite like that. Knowing the course material is necessary but not sufficient. Yes, you do need to know it. Open book can be a bit of a trap. Oh, well, I don't really need to know this very well because it's open book, I'll take it into the exam with me. Not going to work. Right? If you're going to spend three hours of the exam reading chapter four, right? It's not going to work. Don't get trapped by the open book. Have an aim, which you may not go along with in the end, but your aim should be to be able to do the exam without taking any of the material in there with you. Or to take checklists and basic things in to make sure that, yes, I have covered all these points, right? A checklist is what you should be taking in there. And, of course, the course material is very broad, so you've got a lot of checklists you can take in, right? And these people, in a little while, might tell you the sorts of things that they did, but I'd be suggesting that a checklist is all you're taking in Right? Anything else is, oh dear, panic, I don't remember such and such, I think it's in chapter 7, I'll have a quick look, right? But anything beyond that, you are going to really struggle to answer a question because the question does not say what's on page 4 of chapter 7. The, cha the question says, using what's on page 4 of chapter 7, do something a little bit more extensive, right? It presumes you actually understand it, not just can recite it. Welcome to the real world. If it was easy, they wouldn't need you and me. Have a study plan. And a study plan doesn't mean spending a whole lot of time building a beautiful spreadsheet and multiple colours to impress somebody, right? A, a study plan means something that works for you and will drive you in a systematic way to cover the material and learn it all. You're aiming to understand the background and the principles, not just to memorise facts. And so, yes, you've got to do the course twice. Maybe you read it the first time as a novel, probably not the most exciting novel you've ever read, but at least it'll put it into context when you start from chapter one again and then say, righto, ah, I understand why this is relevant because I've read chapter 19. Don't aim to pass the course. Aim to kill it, especially if you're doing 2A. If you're going to do 2B next semester, it's based on 2A. If you know 51% of 2A and scrape through, you're not going to do very well in 2B. Kill the course. Aim to kill the course. Have spare capacity. Pass easily. Don't scrape through. This isn't university. 
I said it's necessary but not sufficient. Okay, well, what else do you need? And we've already heard a few things. Talk to the senior people you work with, actuaries and non-actuaries, and say, what's on your desk this week and this year? What are the issues out there in our industry that I should know about that are not in my course material? Read the Actuaries Institute's online um, newsletters, um, the, what's it called, the Daily News Summary, right? And click on the things that are appropriate to you. If this means, um, people ask me, should I read the financial review? And my basic answer is no, but then there's a but that follows. Um, somehow you've got to absorb and be aware of what's going on out there. Um, there was an article in, for GI people on claims farming the other day by Jeff Atkins in one of the actuarial newsletter things, right? I presume that is not in the GI course, but that's topical. For life people, genetic testing or standard definitions for trauma claims, right? This will not come out of the pages of the course material as an issue, but that's what's out there happening in the industry. Commonwealth Insurance has been caned over the last 12 months for doing what most of us have been doing for 30 years. Um, doesn't mean it's right, but that's an issue. Is that likely to be a question? Well, yeah, maybe. Right? These are the issues. This is where you've got to get beyond the course material because it will help you to answer a question that is a practical question about investments in Australia today or whatever the course is that you might be doing. Study groups have been mentioned. Yes, do that. Having somebody to talk to the day after tomorrow about a question is a good way of motivating you to have actually looked at the question before the day after tomorrow. Right? Some sort of self or, or, or joint management between the two of you. Right? It's the old, you know, I'll do it if you'll do it. Well, okay, let's both do it. Discipline. You are not going to pass if you lead a normal life over the three months of the study period. And if they say actuaries are abnormal, well, welcome to the crew, right? Um, you are going to have to make some sacrifices. If you have a favourite sport, well, okay, don't watch it for the next three months, right? Or play it or whatever it might be, right? You cannot, right? The statistics that show that 30% of people pass say you cannot pass and go on holidays during the semester. You cannot pass and lead a normal life, right? You have to be abnormal, hey, in order to pass. Because of that 30% who've passed, 10% of them were brilliant and have won all the university prizes and they were going to pass anyway. And so there's only 20% left for we, me, mortals, right? <laughs> Don't think that it's like university. It's not. At university, they stand in front of you and say, here's the course material. If you know this, they'll p you'll pass. Out here in the real world, they don't stand in front of you. They stand behind you and we're facing the other way and we throw some things randomly out which you might see come past your ears and you pick them up and go, oh, here's something I need. I want this because it might be in a question. It is not like university. And something has to adapt. Either the course has to adapt and stand out the front and dole the stuff out to you, or you have to adapt. Guess who? <laughs> Things are talking to me. Um, <laughs> write, stu write summary notes. Allocate specific time to the topics that you don't like. It's easy to study the things you do like or you enjoy or you think you know, right? Your bigger risk in the exam is they're going to ask you a question on the one that you didn't like, right? Smarter. Be specific. Here's something I don't understand. How am I going to understand it? Am I going to read the textbook pages for a fourth time? No. 
do something different. Go and find a mate to study with or go and talk to an actuary at work and say, what on earth does this stupid textbook mean? Please explain to me why x plus y is not equal to z in this case. Right? It's all very well to say I've done the course twice, right? But you need to make sure that you're doing it twice in a different way, not two times the same. Um, don't waste the practice questions or looking at the old exam questions until you're pretty close to the exam. If you go and look at them now, you'll go, oh yeah, uh, that's good, right? But do it as a question, right? Closed book, hey, I've got an hour and I want to go to see how much I can do of this question. And then go and have a look at the answer. Whatever works for you will not be the same as whatever works for the person sitting next to you. And these people will have some ideas, some of which you will go, oh, that's a gem. And some of which you will say, like half of which I've just told you, oh no, that's not for me, Bruce. That's fine. Use the ones that work for you. The online forum was mentioned. The minimum is for, um, two plus four questions. Well, do you think you're going to pass if you do the minimum? Do you think you're going to get 10 out of 10 for the forum if you do the minimum? No. Right? But it's the easiest 10 marks you can get. Don't do 2 plus 4. Do 4 plus 10. And then you will have done more learning and you'll get some more marks for it. If you have English as a second language, be aware of that. Be very conscious of the fact that you need to read very carefully what the question says so that you don't just skim over something or other that might, might have been important. And don't get distracted by the changes that are going to hap have to happen to education two years from now. You've got to pass in these two years, right? Don't, don't get too worried about what's happening in the future. Your life doesn't depend on passing the exam, but your livelihood does, right? You can work, you can work at 80% capacity for four semesters and probably not pass. You can work at, maybe not 100, if, if you work at 99% capacity for one semester, you've probably got a better chance of passing, right? Work hard, motivate yourself, be smarter. Now, who's going to speak next? Do we have a... Uh, so my name is Anand. I work with Richard at Life Corner. Um, so I mostly do superannuation consulting work, um, which is why I sat 6A, Global Retirement Systems. Is anyone actually seeing 6A? Or 6B rather? No? Um, but anyway, um, I'll keep it short because I know everyone's hungry. Um, I'll go through five of my experiences that I had studying 6A and five study tips that I can give you. So the first one is that when you first study part threes, you'll find it very scary. So all throughout your uni career, it's probably been a big, scary, daunting thing. And um, it should be because it is scary. And But don't think of that as a bad thing. Think of it as a good thing. Don't take the exams for granted and just study hard. Um, the second thing is I struggled to manage my time at first. Um, you know, you've got work, you've got family, friends, social life. Um, for the first couple of weeks, I found it hard to balance it all, but make sure that in the by two weeks, you've got, got it all sorted out and got the balance right so that you can get your study done. The third thing is that a lot of what you do at work will be relevant to the exam and relevant to your studies. Make sure you use those things to your advantage. Um, the fourth thing is the style of the exam is something new. So normally throughout uni and throughout high school you do paper-based exams. This is a computer-based exam. So there'll be some modeling as well in the exam most likely. Um, so in preparation, make sure you do exams in exam conditions. Make sure you practice in exam conditions. Get a computer out, do all your answers in Word and have Excel on the side as well um, in preparation for that. And um, something specific to 6A is that there's a lot of reading material to do. Make sure you do all the readings, and on top of that, do extra readings, like Bruce said. Um, make sure you're up to date with topical issues. Be well read, um, because sometimes the exams ask for your opinion on things. 
on certain matters. So um, it's important to know about those. And then five study tips. So be efficient in your study. Make full use of your study days. You know, study days are gold. If work gives you study days, make use of them. When, you know, wake up at 6 a.m., treat it like a normal work day, get at least eight hours of study in on that day. Um, it's very tempting to use that day for yourself. You know, mess about, wake up late, but just be disciplined and use it like a normal work day. Treat it like a normal work day. Um, secondly, make use of the fellows around you. You know, you work in, most of you work in insurance firms or actual consultancies. You'll have fellows around you. Talk to them, ask them for tips. I used to get my forum posts peer reviewed by fellows so that I knew they were right and correct. Um, get study tips off them, you know, they've been through the process that you're going through, so they'll know best. Um, thirdly, study smart. You know, um, I found that when I went home, I couldn't get much study done because there's just too many distractions at home. So I used to actually stay at work a couple of hours, study there, miss the traffic on the way home, um, and also study on the train as well or the bus because that's idle time, you're not doing anything. Just make use of that time, be efficient. Fourthly, understand, don't memorize. Like Bruce said again, um, so in uni and high school you can get away with rote learning, but with part threes you can't because um, there are some very oddball questions. Like in my exam I had a question about a dictator, a dictatorship, where there's compulsory euthanization at age 65. Now you can't really prepare for questions like that. So just understand and be well read so you can be ready for those types of questions. And then lastly, just study, study, study. Um, the more you study, the more likely you are to pass. Passing is never guaranteed with part three exams. Um, Richard will tell you that as well. Um, but yeah, the more you study, the higher the likelihood is of you passing. And I'll pass on to Richard. I didn't actually present, um, yeah, bring any slides, so. Um, um, so, a bit of introduction. My name's Tony Cole, and I work uh, at KPMG predominantly in life insurance and um, enterprise risk management services. Um, I've been asked to speak for a few minutes specifically about um, some of the adjustments and learnings uh, that I have uh, between exam uh, attempts. Um, and the reason for that is because, to um, Bruce's point, um, I feel like I'm actually um, a typical example of a mere mortal, um, of um, you know someone that's very average. Um, but I think with the right approach, and you know obviously putting in the work, um, you can have success um, in these exams. Um, so it's important for you to know that um, whilst I had you know success um, last semester in two B. Um, that was actually my second attempt, uh, and I, I actually failed um, in my first attempt um, and actually um, didn't do um, very well. And so from my perspective, I think um, the contribution that I can make um, tonight um, is to just simply demonstrate that um, even for the average person, um, there is definitely hope uh, and there is definitely um, yeah, a, a way for you to um, get through these exams. Um, just looking at the pass rates, they're not particularly inspiring um, and you know, optimism um, inducing, but um, yeah, it, it definitely is possible to, um, to, to bounce back even if you fail. And statistically, there, there will be um, some of you that, that won't pass, particularly on the, um, the first go. Um, so I think I'll just share um, a couple of my um, adjustments or learnings that, that I have um, between my attempts. And the first one, um, that's already been talked about is um, exam technique. So it's, it really is an assumption that you need to know your content well. Uh, you need to know um, how to apply it, what the implications are. Um, but unfortunately, that alone um, generally doesn't strictly mean that you'll pass. Um, so in the exam, you, you have limited time. You're under pressure to demonstrate um, enough knowledge to, to pass. Um, and those forces, um, does make it really hard to um, be able to demonstrate um, your capabilities. 
Uh, and so you do need to be smart and conscious um, ab um, about that so that you can maximize your chances in passing. And so one of the key things that I did um, after I found was actually um, to shift my focus in really fine tuning my exam technique and my approach um, to doing the exams. And um, so checklists ha have been mentioned already. Um, I actually had a checklist, um, not dissimilar to what Danny put up before, of um, yeah, technique um, style points. So things like commenting on answers that look unreasonable, state the blatantly obvious, um, use every word in the question and frame your answers using um, the question. And these are things that you may think, oh, yeah, you know, I heard Danny share them, um, they're in my head and I'll be able to do them. But um, unfortunately, under exam pressure, um, it doesn't come second nature and you do need to practice um, applying them consistently when you do your, um, do your preparation. Um, another quick tip would be um, to, if possible, at the end of the exam, the last five, 10 minutes to actually go through your paper. Um, I find in, in the times that I've passed, um, I, I'm pretty sure I picked up a lot of marks just in the last five minutes where I go through my paper and I picked up a few um, you know, questionable um, answers and, and um, things that I might have missed doing it on the first go. Uh, the second thing I would recommend is to make good notes. Um, I think there's definitely that notion that um, you don't have enough time in the exam to go through notes and to you know, read a chapter or, or do anything like that. But um, from my experience, um, having good notes have actually helped me and, and I've been able to um, um, yeah, use them in the exam. And, but the key thing I think is to have comprehensive, concise, and intelligible notes. So in, they need to be concise. Um, there's no point just repeating the whole textbook. Um, and they need to be comprehensive to cover theoretically everything um, that can come up. And they need to be intelligible. So you need to understand your own notes um, and be able to uh, go to the right places um, under pressure. Um, study groups have been mentioned again. So I think the big adjustment for me um, in my fail attempt and my pass attempt was did participate in, in a study group. I was fortunate to have people in my company that was doing 2B that semester. And I think the key thing there would be um, accountability, um, motivation, and consolidation. So particularly motivation was talked about before. It's inevitable that there are times, particularly if work gets busy, that you lose that motivation. And having a study group, um, I think, makes all the difference. Um, finally, Oh, second last point, I think um, another thing I would recommend is to try to apply what you're studying um, uh, at work uh, and vice versa. So um, do make the most of the resources that you have at work. And I think sometimes it, it's sort of obvious like you would be doing it subconsciously, but if you make a conscious effort in your work to be thinking about the principles um, and how they relate, then you'll just um, be sort of studying um, constantly. Um, and I think I'll just end by saying um, I would recommend that you um, do take the exams very seriously, but also realize that um, passing isn't something that's just in your control. Um, there's, as with all exams, there's an element of um, luck involved. And um, I think if you realize that and do everything you can to put yourself in a position to pass, but then know that, um, you know, there are things that are out of your control, um, you'll enjoy the experience a lot more and you won't put too much pressure and then you end up, um, if you fail, you, you, know, you, you hate life and, and you know, a lot of people will sort of give up and so on. So um, yeah, those are some of my thoughts. All right, part three exams. Who's excited? Nobody? Nobody's excited. You're at the last little bit. Only three more years to go. What was it? All right, so I'm a pricing analyst at AIA. Um, last semester, I attempted both 2A and 2B, and I managed to pass both exams, um, and I received a prize in 2A. Um, and this semester, I'm going to try ERM and CAT, so that'll be fun. Uh, I guess I want to preface this with, if you take one thing away, it's that it doesn't make sense to attempt these exams half-heartedly. You really got to put in your whole effort. It doesn't make any sense in any way to attempt it. 
or maybe I'll pass, maybe I won't, I'll just wing it, right? Because all of you are smart, and it's kind of patronizing to be told you're smart, but you're all smart. You've made it this far, and that 33% statistic, right, that gets chucked around, that's based on smart people, right? It's a biased statistic. So the thing that differentiates people who pass and people who don't is about working hard. Yes, there's an element of luck, but if you work hard, your chances of passing are much higher, right? So it doesn't make any sense to put in anything less than 120%. Um, how to study, I, I think you all know how to study. I'm not gonna go too far into it. Um, plus there'd be a lot of overlap if I did. Uh, one thing I'll make note of is that it's important to use all the time you have, right? It's not that long the semester. Right? So I've done a little table here um, and that's the number of weekend days that you have left. It's pretty hard to study at night or in the morning after work, especially after work, it's really hard. Um, especially if you live far away, like you can use your commute and all that thing, but the weekend days in your study leave are what's gonna be the most valuable time that you have for studying, right? Oh, and that includes Labor Day. So anyone doing ST1 needs to get cracking. So if you've got your textbook, start tonight, open it tonight or figure out what your study plan is tonight. There's stuff you can do straight away and jump on it and focus and keep that focus for the rest of the semester and you'll be sweet. Uh, the material, so you do, as everyone has mentioned, you really need a deep understanding of the material because the exams are about application, right? It's about getting the material and then actually using it in the context of a problem or a professional problem or whatever, right? So the textbook, it's not enough. It's helpful and you, you need to read it, um, but it's not a complete guide to the entire course. There's a number of other things that you should or need to reference. I've put a couple of them up there. Um, the prudential standards, I think, are probably the most, impo most important things you need to reference. The courses do actually recommend you read them, but it's not really a recommendation. You, you need to read them, and they're very boring, but they're important, so good thing to read. Because if you say something that goes in contradiction with the prudential standards, it's probably gonna put you in some hot water with the examiners, so worth reading. There's other stuff. There's the actuarial information and discussion notes for your respective industries. They produce a lot of them about the sort of um, techniques that are used in your industry, and they might be used. They might be using techniques that you don't necessarily use at work. I certainly found that to be true. So that's definitely something that you should check out. And it's also something that's useful for making forum posts. You read it and you see, okay, there's all these different methods, and then you can bring that to the forum post and educate other people about it, and people can educate you, and it's great. So there's insight presentations, which are now on YouTube, I think, um, for all the different industries. So again, um, general life, I'd focus on your one, but. Um, and then, again, your colleagues. They're a wealth of information, they're a brilliant resource to tap into. So worth talking to them and presenting some of the problems that you have with your course to them. Um, so past papers. I think, personally, that you should start doing these as soon as possible, maybe not, um, maybe not straight away before you read anything. So I would try and read the course, like the textbook, in the next two to three weeks and then start doing the past papers, right? Because you'll find that they take three hours, right? It's a three hour exam, you spend three hours doing past papers. It's not often you're gonna be able to find a three hour block of time in between now and the exam. So using each three hour block of time that you get is pretty valuable. And it gives you time to understand what's important in the course, what you should be focusing on, what you should maybe what you're good at, what you're not, it's, it's important to get that kind of perspective and then revisit the material again, right? So doing the entire textbook quite quickly and figuring out exactly what you need, trying to get an understanding, but if you don't understand something, maybe come back to it after you've attempted a question on it or seen something from work. So the actual exams, again, I don't wanna overlap with people too much, but um, it's useful to talk to people who have failed the exams before especially because there's that mechanism where they get interviewed, right? Or they can in interview their examiner. So that means that they will have some insight that maybe not everyone else has, right? Uh, check your work. This is particularly relevant for the Excel spreadsheet part of the exam. Actually just open up your, after you close it, open up your Excel spreadsheet again, check that it hasn't gone all errors, right? Because that does happen. I saw it happen, it was very upsetting. Um, Yep, so you wanna actually create spreadsheets that are readable, logical, you can follow them because not only will you need to follow them and you need to check them, but so will the examiners, so pretty important. Uh, and the last one, only put down the correct information 
this is something I got from someone who failed an exam. He went to an interview and said, why did I fail? And he got shown a sentence that he wrote that essentially said something that was wrong or illegal. And that put him in, like I said, put him in some hot water with the examiners. So while that kind of sounds dumb, only write down stuff that's true, right? You don't want to be putting down something that's wrong. And finally, the forum posts. As everyone has mentioned, it doesn't make sense. They're free marks. You really want to put your best effort into them and try and do as many as you can, as often as you can. It's good to start early because it does get harder to come up with original content um, and the responses become more frequent from other members in the um, course. So it's good to start earlier. Um, there's actually a function on the LMS that you can set up so that you receive an email every time someone makes a post. I would recommend doing that. You do get a lot of emails, but you can sort something out with Outlook and put them in a different folder or whatever, right? So I think that's useful because you can see what everyone's talking about. Um, you keep up with the industry um, happenings, right? Because that's what people are talking about in there. And that's important for your exam to be aware of that and to read other people's forum posts. Even if you're not planning on responding to it, it's worth reading because they'll give you that extra information that you might not have read about in the newspaper or on the actuarial newsletter or something. And that's all I've got. Good luck, everyone. Yeah. So I might stand away from it because I know I'm going to knock it over. Um, so I'm Richard, and I'm the investments representative. Um, and I've unfortunately been given the daunting topic of talking about the, uh, I suppose, insights about uh, how to come first twice. Um, and the first point is I've really got to redouble everything that's been said before. It's about the mere mortal. Um, what they won't tell you about my story is that the first time Ella and I met, uh, I was messaging her after my first pass, um, and I was asking her for the investment, uh, not remark, but the interview to ask her why I passed, because I didn't believe it. Um, and that really stresses how hard these exams are. Um, I'll come to exam technique down the line, uh, but don't underestimate these exams. They do take so much of your time and so much of your heart, um, but you can get through it. It's just a constant process of how do you approach the exams. So in terms of that, and in light of that, the reality check, you're going to be going into this, and you will be, especially toward the end of the exams, doing a lot of hours. Um, and when I say a lot of the hours, use your study days because it will be 15 hours a day, maybe. You'll be getting up, you'll be having breakfast, and you'll be studying. And you'll be studying, and then you'll study some more. The support networks are really important. Oh, can you okay? But the support networks are really important. Um, so when I was preparing the speech, I was watching Market Care. Uh, and fortunately, uh, a guest celebrity came on, and they summed it up really nicely. Uh, it was Claire Smith, who was Gordon Ramsay's head chef for 20 years, oh, 10 years. Um, and she, she took one look at the contestants and said, I don't believe uh, in talent. I don't believe in talented people, and I don't believe in extreme grit. Now, while it might be extreme, she followed up by saying, I believe in hard work. And that's so true, especially for these exams. Um, even in the last round of exams that we've just sat, um, the investment pass rates uh, range between 10% and 20%. And that's the dip that you saw in 2016. Uh, the people that I sat with were smarter than me by a country mile. Um, they failed, I failed, and people failed in the most recent semester as well. It's not necessarily about the smarts. It's about how hard you try. But there are some, I suppose, consistent themes that you can jump into. Um, and I will try to go through them now. So the pregame. The first one is forum participation. Uh, I hadn't been aware that everyone got 100% last semester. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, in the forum participation part of the presentation, if you don't get 100% in forum participation, you don't really deserve to pass. You have almost an unlimited amount of time you have unlimited resources. A forum original post is decent, 
take half an hour, maybe 45 minutes for a rail. And you have so many of those bots leading up to the exam that it's madness not to get those results. One of my best friends got his results, uh, his partner's results for uh, the CT, uh, not CT exam, the UK ERM exam today. She failed by one mark. And this person who is probably one of the smartest people I know. Second point, especially in investment. Does anyone do investments here? Have fun. Um, especially in investments, but uh, maybe in the other courses as well. Um, there are models that you'll have to learn. Facet based models, investment rate models. The thing that was different between the first fails and the second pass um, was the understanding level. You can sit there and you can look at these models and it'll be in the other courses too. And you say, yeah, I get that. I get that. I generally, like, this is how it works. And you can even explain it to your grandma and it'll pass the grandma test. As far as I'm concerned, if you can't sit down in Excel and code me that model from scratch, you don't know it well enough. And that really bit me in the behind for the few exams I've just gone because there's a topic that I really don't like, interest rates, and there are a few exceptionally complicated models in there. And I completely fooled Joe in the first sitting. Bad decision. That's all I'm going to say. Papers. Um, when I sit down or I go to the exam for the exam day, um, I have an exam weekend. So I get up, have my oats in the morning, have my protein shake, go there, listen to some hard EDM, get myself pumped up, maybe some wraps, um, and then I ask people, when I talk to people, how they're going in their studies, uh, especially my friends. Um, and in the most recent paper gone by, you'd go through and you'd ask them, so how many past papers have you done? As if it was, you know, don't beat yourself up before the exam. Um, at least in investments, they give you exams back to 1996. You get two exams, give or take. Um, so you've got 20 exams there. Um, and the number of people that said to me that they'd done up to 2010 was scary. But I looked at the pass rate and you compare the number of papers that have done to the passes, those are a high percentage. Uh, I, for example, I did every Australian paper back to 1996. I did every UK paper down to 2010, every uh, South African paper last three years. I found everything I could. And in the end, it really helped because my exam last semester, question 1A, was almost copy pasted out of the UK exam. It wasn't copy pasted, uh, but <laughs> the logic was the same. And I told one of my friends that, and it was the reason he just, she passed because she sat that exam and she worked out the solution. And she saw it and went, I know how to do that. Most of my friends who didn't do the UK exam had no clue how to do that. It was a hard clue. So that's the pre-game. But unfortunately, the fact of the matter is that it's a 90% <laughs> 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 so you can't screw up the exam. And in every exam that I've sat, from the one that I failed and to the one, two ones that I've done fairly decently in, um, it's always looked the same in the first five to 10 minutes of reading time. Every single time. Um, in the first five, the exam, which had a 10% pass rate, um, about a quarter of the candidates cried in the first 10 minutes. Um, I was laughing hysterically because I knew I was going to. Um, and now if you've seen the movie, unfortunately it doesn't get any better. The first 30 minutes will be an absolute havoc on your mind. You will think, there's no way I'm going to pass this exam. Um, the people who take a breath and get through that first, first 30 minutes without losing themselves are the ones that pass. If you lose yourself there, and I almost lost it in 5A, you can, you can feel it go. And that's all I'll say on that one. Last but not least, know your competitive advantage. Um, and this is what I attribute most fundamentally to me doing decently and getting the prizes this year. I know that my competitive advantage is not mathematics. Yeah, I can sit there and I can do my models and I can do my proof. Um, but against the smart people standing up here, if you ask me to do a mathematical proof with complex maths, these guys are going to beat me every single time. What I know I can compete on, though, is the wording question and the graph interpretation question. And so I know that if I get maybe half marks for the silly proof, then I do the first step proof, and then I say, do this, this, and this, and this is how you rest the proof, I might get 50%. But if I take that time and I allocate it to the wordy questions, I might get the full mark or close to it. So as a counterpoint, in 5A, um, I typed my full exam. 
uh, my exam script, I think, was 27 pages and 5,000 words. Um, I used a lot of time. So to kind of come it all together and to, I suppose, give you a final piece of advice, um, I'm going to draw on something that I was told by one of my former consultants who had an absolutely terrible time getting through the exam, and I'm, I mean terrible. Um, and he, he sat us down, all the guys sitting in the exams, and he said, there's, there's one thing that determines who gets to the end and who doesn't, and only one thing. And it's how much do you want it. So my question to you guys is, how much do you want it? Are you willing to sacrifice? Because if you want it, you'll get it. Thank you very much. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I got assigned a topic talking about the, the CAP course. I was expecting Bruce <laughs> introducing some components in the CAP course, but luckily there's no overlap between my talk and your talk. <laughs> so, all right, so that's my CAP experience. Welcome to CAPLens. That's where all the cases in the course is happening. The cap plan, the, the magic place. Uh, so that's my experience doing the, the cap course. Uh, I listed the, the sessions I attended in the residential course and the, uh, part, the post course assignment and the exam I did. So my, my experience, my tips, my insights will be largely draw upon my experience. Uh, Having said that, if you're doing GI or LIFE or GRIS, so hopefully you can find something helpful from the following slides. All right, so, because I can see two slides on the, on the computer, which is a bit unusual. <laughs> I got confused. Uh, uh, so that's the orientation. Uh, this a set of videos what I want to say is start watching the videos early. You would never regret that you have, it, you have studied early. Uh, the next thing is the, the residential course. Uh, I don't have much to say about the residential course because almost all you need to know about the CAP will be discussed over the course of four days. Uh, the schedule is very packed from early morning, so get good rest at night and be, stay active and stay awake over the course of four days. Then at the end of the uh, residential course, you'll be assigned to a post-course assignment. Uh, I still remember that at that moment, all the students, they get together and they find someone who are doing the same piece of assignment with them and they exchange the contact details, which I found very helpful. I attended one of the group study sessions. So we sit together, analyzing the case together. So to make sure that uh, all the key points, or we think the key points, are discussed. So that can minimize the chance of failing the, the course. So what are, who are the key stakeholders? What are the main business issues about this case? If you can get those things right, I think the chance of failing the assignment is very low. So it's, the, the study group is like an insurance to your assignment. And also, especially for the ESG, research widely, I remember that for my uh, case, I found some, something similar happening in reality. So we were able to get a lot of information to write the reports. And of course, you can also get some verbal advice from your colleagues. Uh, then after submitting the assignment, so it's the only thing left is the exam. Uh, so for, for the pre-exam preparation, everything you are doing is to minimize your level of stressness during the exam. So it's about how you feel confident looking at the case. So find, use the past papers, there are tons of past papers back to, I can't remember, 2005? I don't know, it's tons of past exam papers you can utilize. Find your own way of analyzing the case. The case might be very long, but 
you can break them into steps, do the, say, contextualization first, write down the key things, and then plan your reports. Everyone has their own way of approaching the, the case. So find your own way and keep practicing. And then by the time you go to the exam, it's just another practice, another repetition of your practice. And you can feel very confident. And at the same time, build your own templates, uh, doing the contextualization, your report, your spreadsheet. So that can save a lot of time in, in the exam and also make you very confident in the exam. Uh, make use of the online forum. For the CAP course, the special thing is that the past papers, they do not provide solutions or answers. So it's really up to you to put up questions in the online forums and you can write your own report, your own executive summary and get feedback. My experience is that students and teachers, they're very friendly in giving the, the, the answers and feedback to your report or executive summary. And also check the past forums. I find a lot of useful information by checking the past forums. Uh, I put the last point, some Excel tricks, because in my work, I don't use Excel a lot. So I find that in the, in the preparation for the exam, I gain a lot learning those shortcuts, those fancy functions in Excel and save me a lot of time. All right. so. Just a few summary points. Uh, start early for the pre-course orientation. Stay awake for the residential course. Of course, that's the bottom line. Stay engaged for the for the residential course. Uh, get some external support for your post-course assignment, whether it's from your peers, your colleagues, or even from the internet. And for the exam, build your own way of approaching the case and keep practicing for it. Okay, so that's it for me. Um, so thank you very much to all our good speakers. We really appreciate you guys coming in. We're going to open it up for questions um, that you have for anyone in the panel. And then, you know, we'll take, we'll take about 15 minutes for questions. If we don't have anything, we'll be closing out. And of course, for those who are here with us, we do have, you know, some pizzas and stuff. So if you want to hang out and get to know each other, maybe start forming those study groups, you're welcome to do so. And for those online, we'll be signing off after the question portion. So does anyone have any questions? Anyway. Okay, so this will just give you an update, I guess, on the education strategy review. Um, we have been putting out communications on that. So at the moment, we're at the stage where we're doing the implementation plan, which is obviously will be done again in consultation with the members, and we'll be coming back to you for more feedback on, you know, on the structure. So at the moment, by the end of the year, we will know what that will look like, and you know, obviously, um, this is involved. This is the examiner, so we do get his input and some things he's been thinking about. And yeah, there will be changes to the program, which we obviously do need to wait to the beginning of the year. And as soon as that's definite, we will definitely be communicating that. Um, do we have any other questions? Two mics, thank you.
Yes, and so hopefully in this case they won't be terribly different. No, there is no magic bell curve such that you know a certain number of people will pass. Um, it would be interesting to actually see the, the curves, but they don't actually exist. We don't do that. There is a standard, and if 97% of the people exceed the standard, you will see a 97% pass rate. Unfortunately, we've seen too much of the opposite, where only 10% of the people that exceeded the standards, the first standard, only seen a 10% pass rate. One of the aspects that we've looked at very closely is the people who are just above and just below passing. And not only two markers for every question, but also the chief examiner and the distance will probably be looking very closely at what that person has written. In order to say, has this person done enough to pass? And or has this person made me cringe? Danny mentioned earlier fitness with practice. Right? If we are looking to pass somebody, one of the questions that we're asking is, has this person dropped a camera? Right? Am I proud to have this person standing in the office beside me as a member of the profession? Would I be proud to have this person recruited as a partner in my consulting business? Right? Those questions don't require that we get 100% honest and those questions don't require you people to know everything that I know. I'm confident some regularity and as you would guess it is difficult to tell whether this was a difficult question or exam or this cohort of students is a poor cohort. 
wearing a different hat as a tutor of Zoo A, I have been phoned by the Triple Seminar some semesters ago and asked, what did you think of the cohort's view this time through? Now, of course it's a very good question, right? But you answer it honestly. And in that case, I honestly answered, well, sorry, the first part of the answer was, it's difficult to tell for the whole cohort because in a tutorial you will get noisy people who can dominate and that can make everybody look good. In the online forum you can get a few good people who come up with good questions and um, help everybody else through. Having put the disclaimer aside, I said, I think this semester of the week is an average group. They were really worried as examiners that they were going to have such a low pass rate. They came to as many sources as, as they could to try and find out where it really was an unusually difficult couple of questions. At the end of the day, it was an art, not a science. So when the examiners came to that question, they of course were trying to answer that question before or while they were sitting the setting the exam. They were trying not to set a particularly difficult or a particularly easy exam. I suspect they would have really achieved the setting of those interviews had they not said it's a particularly easy exam.